Grant Wall was the writer from Sports Illustrated who profiled LeBron James back in 2002, and Grant joins us now from Vancouver. Does it feel like it's been that long, Grant? You know, now that I think about it, it does feel like it's been a little while, you know. It's been, wow, 13 years. But uh, just had an amazing experience on that story with uh, a junior high, or a junior in high school, LeBron, and uh, he was not guaranteed to become what he's become. But when you went in to do that interview, did you have who who had to agree to it? His mom or somebody sign off for you to put him on the cover as a junior in high school? Well, it didn't start knowing it would be a cover. Um, you know, he had had a big summer uh, at the ABCD camp that previous summer and had uh, really stood out as the best player in his class in those months that followed. And the timing seemed right in January of '02 to to go to Akron and do this story. I contacted his high school and talked to his high school athletic director who said, come on in, and actually remembered that LeBron wasn't all that thrilled that I came in without much notice. And I had to sort of pull him aside and say, look, this could be a big story in Sports Illustrated and, and, and potentially a cover. And I ended up getting you know, driving LeBron and his high school buddies up to a, uh, an NBA game in Cleveland where Michael Jordan was playing for the Wizards and hit a buzzer beater. Uh, and after the game, LeBron met up with Jordan, and uh, that ended up being the lead in my story. But getting on the cover, I was surprised they put him on the cover. It was in the middle of the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City, and here we were doing something that some could argue could really hurt the kid's life since he was only a junior in high school. What was the buzz around him locally? Because it's one thing to sell something nationally or, or that somebody's really big locally, but you know, now he's, he's called the chosen one. <laughs> I'll give some credit to Greg Kelly, the Sports Illustrated editor, who came up with the chosen one cover line because I think LeBron liked it enough to get a tattoo of it, essentially. Um, there were enough people locally who knew that LeBron had the chance to be something absolutely huge. They'd been following him for a while. The games for his high school were drawing far more than the Akron University games uh, at the time, and, and that was a big deal. Um, you know, nationally, I remember speaking to Danny Ainge at the time, and I think there was a quote in the story about how Ainge had said that there were only a couple of players in the NBA at that time that he wouldn't trade to get LeBron, that he was that good uh, even then. What was his home life like? We went to his apartment in West Akron, and uh, it was nothing fancy at all. You know, this was a pretty rough part of town, high-rise building. Um, you know, it was just him and his mom at that time living together. Uh, and I remember watching uh, a couple of his favorite uh, videos with him at, you know, inside the apartment there and, and getting a sense of what he was about. And it was a weird feeling because he knew that, he was less than a year away from, we talked about it being a $20 million shoe contract. It ended up being a $90 million shoe contract. <laughs> and yet he was living in this situation, you know, in, in a tough part of town. And it wasn't guaranteed. If he'd gotten, you know, if he'd broken his leg the next day, that, that $90 million might not have happened. But remember the controversy when he had a Hummer that, that they, he was driving around and like a, was it a champagne color Hummer and, and people wanted to know who bought it for him because his mom didn't have the means to buy him a car like that? Well, that's what happened during his senior year of high school when you know, the Sports Illustrated cover came out. And uh, you know, I remember being at a drive through McDonald's with him and saying, like, this cover looks like it might really happen. And just kind of, you know, this is going to have a pretty big impact on your life as far as being recognized and change just the way people view you. And um, he seemed excited about it. Uh, but there was so much attention that year, and his high school team started playing in tournaments all around the country for, you know, people were paying big sums of money for this. And so he knew what kind of value he was generating. And things did get crazy, you know. The Hummer came and uh, suspension from uh, the Ohio High School State Association and, you know, free throwback jerseys, and, and it became a huge circus. And, and I'm sure that the SI cover had an influence on that, but I think we were pretty aware of, of how that would change his life by putting him on the cover. We're talking to Grant Wall, Sports Illustrated, back in 2002, did the cover story on LeBron James when he was a junior in high school. Uh, where was LeBron's dad? Was he 
at all in the picture when you were uh, doing this article? Not at all in the picture. Um, yeah, uh, and, and hadn't been uh, really basically ever. Uh, so uh, that was a pretty common story when I was covering basketball at the time, you know, and, and even now, you know, that uh, often it's the mom is there and the dad isn't. I know that uh, you make your living uh, with soccer, and uh, I, I couldn't have you on without at least getting your rela- reaction to what happened with the FIFA re- re-election for Sepp Blatter. I, I, I mean, the timing of it, and to still get re-elected, how monumental was that for Sepp Blatter with FIFA? Well, I mean, it, it's big for Blatter to get a, a fifth four-year term. He's been in charge since 98 of an organization that everyone uses dirty, and now the U.S. Attorney General Loretta Lynch is saying publicly that it's a clearly corrupt system that they're going after. Uh, and so for Blatter to be reelected two days after that, after nine FIFA officials were arrested, um, you know, that shows how broken FIFA is and that this organization is going to change. It's not going to happen from the inside. You need the U.S. government to come in and put people in jail. You need the Swiss government to investigate the bids to World Cup 18 and 22. Uh, we're hopefully at just the start of this process, and from the arrest last week, if they can uh, provide evidence and flip uh, uh, so that we can get even higher up the FIFA food chain, that would be great. What if the United States was involved in a boycott of the World Cup? In a what? A boycott, if if you know, as a show of protest here, or what's going on with FIFA, or 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 is this? Yeah. D- d- would that matter at all? I think it would potentially matter, in, in part because, especially if you could get some of the top soccer nations and nations like the U.S. that put a lot of money into soccer, you know, the biggest rights fee television-wise for the, any country in the world for the World Cup is from the United States. When you add up Spanish language and English language, you're talking over a billion dollars. Um, Germany, England, the Netherlands, other you know, big soccer countries, if they were to, to band together and, and threaten to boycott, I think they'd have a lot of power. But at this point, I just don't see it happening. We've never seen a, a country boycott a World Cup. Uh, it's not like the Olympics. And I'm, I'm curious as to why that's the case, but it just is. Um, and you look at uh, at the history of it, and I can only think of one player, Johan Cruyff, one of the best players in the world, boycotted the 78 World Cup in Argentina because of their military dictator of killing their own people. But that's about the only example I can think of in the history of FIFA. Did the U.S. hurt future World Cup bids by this action? I think so, possibly. Uh, and the good thing about that is, and I'll explain why that's the case, uh, U.S. soccer, uh, which is led by a guy named Samuel Gulati, who's on the FIFA executive committee, came out and said that they were going to support the challenger to Bladder. They were going to go against Bladder. Um, Blatter still won the election, and Blatter still, as a result, has a lot of power at FIFA. And, you know, he's been a vindictive guy in the past, and so it's certainly possible that Blatter will try to influence any future votes for World Cup votes against the United States because the U.S. supported his opponent last week. But the cool thing was, was that Samuel Gulati actually came out and said, look, it's far more important to me that FIFA clean itself up than having the U.S. host the future World Cup. I'd love to host a future World Cup, but it's not the number one priority at this point. And I think that's leadership and, and taking the right stand. I also, I said at the time, you know, part of it was being sarcastic, but this is the greatest soccer moment in U.S. history with what happened with, with FIFA. <laughs> that's a little uncharitable, Dan. <laughs> uh, to, to the well, most impactful. The but... team and the O2 men's quarterfinalists at the World Cup. Okay, how about most Im- most impactful, Grant? Was this the most <laughs> impactful? It, you can make that argument. Okay. You, know? you have, this is really the first time that I can ever remember that this whole idea of Team America World Police has been embraced by hundreds of millions of people around the world. You know, the U.S. has been vilified over the years for, for getting involved in things that some people think are outside its jurisdiction, but the response in most places around the world among soccer fans is, go U.S., go Loretta Lynch, and you know, get these guys. Have fun in Vancouver, and uh, good to visit with you again, Grant. Thanks for joining us. Likewise, Dan. Take care. All right. Grant Wall, Sports Illustrated uh, soccer writer, who also did the profile, the cover story of LeBron James.